I am so pleased to be able to welcome you to the first panel of uh, this wonderful conference. As uh, Bill Maher mentioned, and thank you so much for uh, the gracious introduction, I have the pleasure of, um, it's an honor to serve on the advisory board of um, the Institute, and um, I am TFI. And with that comes uh, a delightful uh, uh, task, which is to look at the proposals that come in uh, uh, on the research that the, the Institute supports. I'm very, always very interested in learning about places uh, in the world that I have yet to travel to, let alone know more uh, about scholarly. And so coming here and learning about some of uh, these uh, uh, projects, works in progress, is a special uh, event for me. So I will see how they've progressed from the time when I read smaller blurbs to the presentations today. Our panel uh, today has three, this morning I should say, has three speakers. Um, Sibel Kusimba uh, from Northern Illinois University and I'm hoping that, yes, Magdalena Villarreal and Isabel Guerin, is that how you would pronounce your name? Yes, exactly. Very good are coming up, and then another team, Heather Horst and Aaron Taylor. Each of them will have about 20 minutes, well I should say no more than 20 minutes, so that we can um, keep on schedule. And after that, we will have time for questions. So if uh, you would please just jot notes, uh, you can ask the presenters questions at the end, um, toward the end, after all the presentations. Uh, Presenter, just a quick logistic note, I will be sitting here and sort of tell you about how you're doing on time, um, about five minutes before your 20 minutes run out, if you will. Okay, very good. Everyone's ready to go to listen to um, what, uh, to the work, to the research findings. And the first one will be by Sibel Kusimba from Northern Illinois University. Families, groups, and mobile money in Kenya. Sibel, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm new to the study of mobile money, uh, but this has been one of the most interesting projects I have ever done. So I want to thank, on, on behalf of my excellent team, I want to thank the Institute for the opportunity to do this research. I'd also like to thank, I'd also like to thank, uh, in addition to the team in the field, Elizabeth Gross, uh, for drawing these social networks that I'm going to show you. Uh, how do I move this? Okay. Um, so I'm an anthropologist. Actually, originally, uh, I was studying kinship in the family. Then I began to notice that from 2002, Everyone was using their mobile phones to interact with each other. From 2007, people were sending money remittances to their friends and family at a furious pace. And I realized that that was, in fact, a fascinating opportunity to examine this new technology. Uh, to what extent are cultural ideas about kinship and the family and about money being changed by this new technology of mobiles and mobile money? Okay. Research locations, uh, we were in Kimilili, in Bungoma town, in Naitiri, in Kitale, in western Kenya. This is a mixture of urban and rural areas. Uh, we also had a group in Tezo, in Kilifi district, in the coast province. And we've also been working, we've also been working with uh, Kenyan immigrants in the United States examining the issue of international remittances. So I'm going to try to fold that into the um, talk today, today, although I'll be mostly be focusing on the Kenyan um, center of uh, what happens with these remittances as well. Okay, uh, as I said, Western Kenya is a very diverse area. According to recent publications, uh, 50% of people here have a mobile phone. My sense is that it's much larger than that. Certainly access is much, much greater than 50%. Uh, 
Um, I suppose it's very, very difficult to really um, get accurate information on many of these survey questions. Um, about 80% of the people in Western Kenya are subsistence farmers, although there are some very thriving commercial areas, particularly in towns like Kitale, which is a, a very um, well-to-do uh, and important commercial center. Um, so there are many different kinds of communities here, and we tried as much as possible to sample all of them. Uh, extended family bonds are very, very important, of course, in East Africa. Uh, traditions of the extended family among peoples of Western Kenya include um, factors that are still very important today, patrilineal inheritance, patrilineal social identity, uh, polygynous marriage, which um, is partly valued because it brings bonds with in-laws and it extends uh, the social grouping. So social networking is something that people have been doing here for hundreds of years. Um, nevertheless, it's a place where there's very rapid social and economic change uh, because of um, high birth rates and other factors. Uh, those traditional ties to the land are uh, less and less possible for many people. So there's really a desperate need, especially for the youth, to develop new forms of livelihood here. And so there's a huge interest in seeing if mobile money can enable that. All right, so mobile money in Western Kenya. Um, the system began with sending money, remittances, to friends and relatives near and far. Um, there are other means that people use quite commonly in Western Kenya, uh, using the phone as a bank. Some people feel the phone enables their savings. Other people feel it does quite the opposite, which um, is interesting. I might have time to talk about that. And uh, people also buy and, and um, send airtime to people uh, who are close to them quite a bit as well. Uh, there are, of course, many other uses for mobile money systems in Kenya, which are some of the most successful in the world, and so there's been quite a bit of development. Um, business people use it a lot uh, for their, uh, for their um, contacts and to buy stock and to pay bills. Um, people also link to banking services as well. Um, but I've put all of that in the category of uncommon uses because for most of the people I interviewed who are subsistence farmers, they simply don't really have enough money to make use of those interconnectivities with banks. We found that very few people um, have a bank account. With international remittances, which is a, a small part of what I'll be looking at today, uh, it's gotten incredibly easy. Through the partnership with Western Union, you can log on to the Western Union website and send money to the f directly to the phone of a Safaricom subscriber. So it's just gotten incredibly easy, and you can do this from, um, they say, 43 different countries. It certainly works um, quite smoothly from the United States. But mostly we're dealing with the system of day-to-day uh, -day support and remittances amongst kin and relatives is primarily what we're looking at in Western Kenya. Okay, what are some of the reasons for remittances? Why would you uh, send one? Um, again, it's ethnographically quite complex, but I've tried to sort of talk about some, some different circumstances under which you might uh, use mobile money transfers. The first might be urgent needs. Now urgent needs are initiated by the person who wants to receive and usually this is a crisis kind of situation. Now it's, it's difficult to ask and it's also difficult to send. So what I found is that people tend to rely on someone who is the same age as them when they are in a crisis. They will um, contact a brother or a sister um, or a close friend or other age mates. People are reluctant to um, worry or disturb a grown child or their parents when they uh, are in a crisis type of situation. So uh, I'm, I'm stranded and I need transport or uh, so-and-so has been sent home from school because we don't have any fees, that kind of thing. Um, another broader category might be everyday expenses or as opposed to urgent needs, anticipated needs. And oftentimes the conversation about these flows will begin months or even years in, in advance. So, uh, you know, so-and-so has just taken the KCPE and she's passed with such and such marks. You know, by uh, sending that news around the family, they let it be known that, uh, you know, they will be looking for help for school fees for such a child, that kind of thing. So there's a very complex back and forth that uh, goes around in the family when these remittances um, are actually performed. Another interesting uh, me means of remittances are the social payments, uh, especially at 
funerals and in the Bungoma region, the coming of age ceremonies for young men are still being performed. Um, increasingly less commonly. Um, but uh, with social payments, there's a contribution, let's say, that is made as a funeral. It's a very public event. There is a book that is signed. And there's a lot of uh, discussion going around in Kenyan society today about whether or not a remittance can really substitute for the presence of a person at one of these uh, ceremonies where the belonging, the inclusion in the social group is so important and is sort of symbolically performed. Um, here in the United States, um, uh, Kenyans who are from Western Kenya are often asked to contribute uh, for funerals and what they will do is send the money to a friend who then converts it to cash and brings it to this very public ceremony and signs the book on their behalf. So there is a loss of social capital sometimes with the use of mobile money. Um, which brings me to the other side of mobile money. It's not just for economic purposes, of course. There's a very strong cultural and social importance to mobile money in Kenya, which I think me might be part of the reason why it's so popular here. Um, and you can see this with airtime. Airtime isn't technically mobile money, of course, but it is a form of value that is transmitted amongst people um, through their mobile phones. And it's a very common kind of transmission and usually in very small amounts. And uh, people will send a small amount of airtime to a friend to say thank you for something. Um, I uh, taught for a year at Egerton University, and my students told me that uh, to, send, to send someone mobile money was a way of making a romantic overture towards someone. And uh, the, the male students were always complaining that the women students were asking them for airtime. So it's clearly not just about economics. It's about your social network and about uh, building your social um, capital as well. So every remittance then has that economic aspect to it, but I think even more important is the social and cultural meaning. It's an expression of friendship. It's a performance of kinship. And for people who are uh, in the rural areas in Western Kenya who receive a lot of remittances, it really doesn't matter to them where you are. You could be just a few kilometers down the road in Bungoma town. You could be as far away as Kansas, for example. But if you've sent your remittance, it means that you want to belong, that you want to be included. And that's taken very seriously. So when you talk to people um, whose children are very far away, they talk about them as if they're right there. So even if you've been in Kansas for more than 10 years, your mother will still say, He's very useful around here, and he takes care of me. I think it's a testament to just how strong uh, these social bonds are in uh, Western Kenya. Okay, I want to talk about uh, a dynamic that I uh, discovered that I thought would be very important. Um, sometimes mobile money is used for the individual and the private and the personal, and I call that the sort of me performance in the use of mobile money. In other cases, it is used in a collective or a group kind of a setting. So I want to talk about both of these um, separately. First, the sort of personal or private me use of mobile money. Um, definitely when you ask people, what do you like about mobile money, both men and women will tell you that uh, it's about empowering them to make individual decisions, private decisions. Women in particular talk about how they are able to uh, save money on their phone, spend money on school fees or on contributions to their savings groups, um, go to the hair salon, spend money, uh, send money to their mother or send money to their sister without their husband finding out. So it's clearly very important to them. Uh, and Professor Marr has talked about the relationship between gender and the phone and the idea of, of empowerment, of empowerment of women. Um, what women don't like is that men also have phones and they're also empowered. Um, one lady told us um, men should not have phones because uh, men should not have M-Pesa because uh, uh, there are a lot of divorces going on around here because of M-Pesa. Again, it's the social and cultural importance of um, this technology that really matters to people. Um, and interestingly, men will say the same thing about their phone, that they feel that it empowers them to do things with their money, even sending money to their mother without telling their wife about it. So, 
Um, international remitters in particular also like the capacity to send money directly to somebody's phone. And they say that they avoid the family politics there. Often their remittances are very large, usually about 10 times larger than a remittance that comes from within Kenya. So there is a lot of family politics that develops there. Um, often what they'll do is choose one individual, often it is their mother, who becomes sort of the broker for these remittances. In other words, they'll send money to their mother and then they'll tell their mother to figure out who really needs it, uh, who needs school fees the most, who uh, you know needs, um, needs this money the most, and they'll allow their mother to make their decisions. And in so doing, they're also giving their mother the remittance of giving her the prestige and the authority that comes from being able to control and redistribute this, um, this money in the family. So the personal individual use of mobile money is very much valued. Um, in looking at this question, I began to realize that it was important to map out these flows of money and see how they um, move around in a family. So um, part of our interviews was to uh, construct social networks, asking people who they send money to, who they receive from. Um, so when you draw those, you get something that looks like this. Um, actually look at what I'm saying here. So uh, we started with Atieno. She's a, a lady from the um, Luo areas of Kenya. So she's about three or four hours driving away from her uh, natal area. She lives in Nigeria and she's a trader. So we asked her who she's connected to. So um, she's married, but she didn't name her husband as someone she's connected to. She named her sister Mary, and the other people in this network are her children and her sister's children. So of course we could keep going. This, these are uh, incomplete networks. But by starting with one individual and seeing the people who are close to them, you get a sense of who the basic units, the most core um, networks people are reaching out to. Then you can expand these to look at extended families. You generally find a pattern of cliques or very closely interconnected people who are connected by bridges to other cliques or uh, very interconnected people. And something quite interesting about these networks is that that core group very often consists of a group of siblings. They are often connected to their mothers and through their mothers to their matrilineal kid. Not exclusively, but often. Okay. So for example, in this family, we have, um, if I have a pointer here or not, um, maybe I don't, but uh, in the uh, center there, you have a group of siblings, uh, Julia, Juma, Agnes, and Evelyn. And they have two, three brothers, Augustine, Vincent, and Rogers. So in other words, this is a group of six siblings, and they're connected to their children, and in some cases to their husbands and wives as well. Um, the group off to the left there is an in-law tie. This is the husband of Julia and the husband's family. So when you connect these two ethnographic interviews with the people inside these networks, you also get a richer sense of what is going on. Um, we asked Julia's children uh, about this network, and they all said the same point about matrilineal networks. They said that their mothers and their, uh, their mothers, sisters and brothers are the ones who really help them with things like school fees. And they said that their father's relatives are not very much in their lives. Um, so these are patterns that we found over and over again, looking at generation and types of kin using Juma's family as an example again. People send money to people who are the same generation as them. Again, this suggests that crisis mode, oh my gosh, okay. And um, it's interesting because many people think of these remittances as from one generation to the next, but most of them are in fact within the same generation. You also find, um, again, the emphasis on maternal ties rather than paternal ties. And the fact that in-law ties, including marriage, are not very common. People don't send money to their husbands and wives nearly as much as they send money to their sisters and brothers and their mothers and their mother's family. So um, I think that pattern is quite 
interesting. Um, and it really does beg an explanation because it's really the opposite of what you would expect based on the anthropological literature in East Africa. Um, especially in Western Kenya, people are patrilineal. Your social identity comes from your father. When it comes to inheritance and communal claims to important resources, it's usually done through the father's side of the family. And here we have networks of everyday support that are actually flowing through the mother's side of the family. So I think that's very interesting and it suggests several things that are going on. One might be um, cultural change, the fragmentation of extended families into female-headed households. But it's also true that women in this part of Kenya have always been quite independent because of the tradition of polygynous marriage. Um, we're also tapping into something, I think, that often flies under the radar in um, patrilineal societies, and that is what Marjorie Wolf called uterine kinship. And she actually worked in Taiwan, um, which is not Africa, but it was a patrilineal rural society, and she described how a young bride comes to her husband's family. She doesn't know anyone, and she has to build her own social networks. She makes friends, and most importantly, she has children. And her children are going to be her source of um, support for the rest of her life. And I think that's what we're tapping into with uh, mobile money in many ways. It's an individual kind of a network, and people are sending money to the people who are closest to them. And those are the people with whom they have um, close memories of childhood and of growing up. Okay, so uh, matrilineal networks. Um, I, th I have very little time left, so I don't really have time, unfortunately, to talk about some of the other findings that I had, but I did want to mention that the me aspect of mobile money is just one part of it. There's also the us aspect and the way in which mobile money is used by groups, savings groups and Roscas. I was surprised at the extent to which this is very much used. Um, even though this system of mobile money is really meant for person-to-person -person transfers, but many associations and groups will use it um, uh, to make monthly contributions, uh, to pay out money uh, each month to people. Um, they also use it for table banking, so for the contributions, some of them will be given out, others will be um, lent out with interest in terms of table banking. Um, so I think what's going on is that mobile money is very useful to people from that I perspective, but that people also want to use it from the we perspective. Um, they want to be able to use it more effectively in groups um, and associations. And right now, the technology is really one-to-one. -one. So what c came to me as I was thinking about what I had learned this summer is that mobile money should somehow be transformed into a group kind of facility whenever people want it to be. It, for example, if you're a member of a savings association with 12 other women, what if all 12 women got the same text message that said, so-and-so has made her contribution for the month? Eh? Or uh, you know, something like that I think would be really helpful for people. Because right now the I aspect of this, the me aspect, is very well served by this technology, but uh, there's so many other ways in which people want to form groups and they could, um, I think, be very well served by a we kind of mobile money. Okay, so. Magdalena Villarreal from Center for Advanced Research and Postgraduate Studies in Social Anthropology, and Isabelle Guerin, Institute of Research Development, Paris 1 Sorbonne University. And you have your presentation? Yes. How do I change the slide? How do I change the slide? Let's see. Should just be pressing to the right side? I think so, yes. Okay, thank you very much as well. I want to thank the organizers and Bill and Jenny for their kindness and their being so helpful for, uh, to us with this project. Um, I have to say this is the second time I have a project. The first one we, I studied in s southeastern Mexico in Chiapas, and now I am doing work in the west of Mexico and doing a comparison with Isabel Guerrero, uh, and she's working in India. 
uh, Isabel and I had previously <clears throat> worked in a project where we, we looked into financial practices in India, Madagascar, and Mexico. But there was so much information, so much, that in the end we left so many stones unturned that we turned to IMTFI to do the, the, the comparison between India and Mexico in terms of the generation, storage, and exchange of value. <clears throat> so we are now looking more precisely on the issue of value and, and how it is socially um, uh, uh, conceived, transformed, exchanged, and stored. <clears throat> The aims of the project are to compare the processes, as I say, of generation, storage, accumulation, mobilization, and exchange of money and non-monetary valuables. Uh, we include the non-monetary ones because we had already realized from the previous project that it was not only money, but it was all different kinds of values that had been transformed, exchanged, including social material and symbolic values that, that come very strongly into the picture. The frameworks of calculation, how people calculate the value that are entailed in a social relationship or in a material object or in a symbolic object, if you want. So what comes into the calculation it is very important to us. What is left out of the ca calculation? What do people consider trivial or what they consider important is often not the same. And especially when we are doing the comparison between India and Mexico in two different cultures, it is so important to see the ways in which different, I will talk a little bit about, we will talk a little bit about it in, in a minute, but, um, but how these differences come to the fore. And for us, that has to do with the changing meanings of money and financial practices and the significance that is attributed to them differentially in the different countries and in the different settings. Um, also the financial instruments that people use for one and the other. Uh, there is a, not a lot of mobile money being used in the two countries. There is a little bit beginning in Mexico, but not necessarily amongst the poorest yet. There is, now that I heard the previous presentation, I said, oh my God, there is time, to, the air time. That is one thing that they do pass uh, uh, a lot to one and the other. But um, uh, not so much in terms of sending money to each other yet. Yet there are different instruments that are being used and a lot of it has to do with keeping things in mind or with writing notes or with a notebook as I, as we can see in the picture. This is a notebook from an Indian uh, uh, case. Uh, uh, Isabel will speak about Tamil Nandu in, yeah. in, in South India. So I'm going to give you very quickly a few basic features regarding the Indian context. So the project focuses on a very specific part of India, um, villages from northwest uh, Tamil Nadu, which is a state located in the southwest uh, of India. So people combine um, agriculture uh, either as small farmers or as landless laborers who work for others. And they, they combine agriculture and incre increasingly with, with, with non-farm labor, uh, which is an increasing source of income, especially for men who migrate uh, to nearby cities for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Um, mainly in the construction sector or as manual laborers in, in markets. Caste, as, as, as elsewhere in, in, uh, in India, is, re remains a very uh, important feature of, of economic, social, cultural, religious, political life. It's, uh, economically, uh, we still have a very strong segmentation of labor according to caste. Socially, uh, we have very strong caste-based identities and, and social hierarchy uh, with important consequences for our topic because caste remains a very important marker of valuation. It also remains a very uh, important feature of debt. Depending on your caste, you don't borrow from the same source. You don't lend to the same persons. Magdalena will come back to this later, but I, now I can just say that 
um, that is clearly thought as a marker of social hierarchy, where the, cre the creditor is above the debtor, which means that people don't borrow to those who are below them, uh, only to equals or to those who are above uh, them. Magdalena will come back to this later. Um, regarding value, land, housing, livestock, jewels are important sources of, of, of value, but, but process, uh, processes of valuation differ significantly along caste, along class, along gender lines. Uh, if we take land, for instance, upper class and upper caste are increasingly leaving agriculture for urban activities and selling, they are increasingly selling land, land with, as a consequence, in, uh, significant transfers of land toward middle and, and low caste, who, by contrast, still want to be farmers and still consider land ownership as a source of so social status, even though agriculture is not is very poorly uh, profitable, especially in, in, in dry areas. Housing is also clearly a marker of, of status, whatever the community, with very important expense to renovate and enlarge houses. It's clearly a source of internal differentiation within, within social groups, people trying to distinguish themselves from the neighbors through housing. Life, livestock is also valued, but as, by contrast with Mexico, is, is not as a way of uh, for accumulation. People hardly own more than a few goats, a few goats, a few cows, sorry, and a few goats in a context uh, uh, where a large part of the population is vegetarian. The livestock market is not very active, but cows still have a very strong uh, um, so symbolic and social value. Uh, they are used for uh, social and, and uh, religious rituals. Jewels are also an important source of value, but uh, especially for men, for women, uh, as it is often the only assets that they, that they own. Uh, regarding investments, there are economic and material investments uh, in land and agriculture, sometimes in, in small businesses, uh, in, in housing, as I was saying, but investments in social and religious uh, rituals are extremely important, uh, especially marriages. Uh, which are very important uh, to uh, gain status at the household level with people who frequently spend uh, several years of household income in, in, in marriages. Uh, also very important uh, investment in festivals, uh, which are an important marker of status more at the community level. Um, last point I could May as regarding financial practices, uh, Magdalena will come back to this. The fact that people juggle with a large range of financial instruments. Um, the, the, one of the specificity of the Indian context is the recent emergence, by recent I mean over the last 10 years uh, from, uh, approximately, of self-help groups, which is a typical form of Indian uh, uh, microfinance. Uh, so yes, here we have an example with a picture of uh, women who uh, together a group of 15 to 20 mo women who first rotated the money internally and then who are eligible uh, for a, an external loan from uh, an MFI or from a bank. Can stop here? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Seven. Uh, in, in contrast, we um, uh, in Mexico, we are in Western Mexico, in the kind of central Mexico. Now, this is an irrigation district, so Within Mexico, it is not the poorest. And when trying to compare India and Mexico, we have seen that perhaps we will also have to compare with other Mexican regions because somehow, sometimes it doesn't parallel. Here, we, uh, there is maize, a little bit of maize, which is m linked to more traditional agriculture, but a lot of sugarcane, as we can see in the picture, the sugarcane cutters. Sugarcane cutters come from the poorer uh, sectors of, 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 of the country, from, from poor uh, states, from the southeast especially. And, and that is considered one of the lower categories of workers in the region. And horticulture, horticulture you have even Californian enterprises, strawberry and berries and, um, and, and tomatoes uh, coming into the region and also hiring locally, but a lot, hiring a lot of people from poorer states of Mexico. So you have a very differentiated economy in, 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 this, in, the, in this El Grullo, which is where we are doing the research. Now, cattle as a source of value. Uh, Isabel was talking about livestock and, and 
providing status. In Mexico, livestock provides status, but it is also, to a large degree, a store of value. It is increasingly uh, becoming less efficient in terms of store of value because it does not move as rapidly as other, other uh, ways of storing value. Cattle, it takes more time to sell and you have to find the right price and the cattle has to be fat, etc. But still, it is still considered an important store of value. But also, people invest in homes, in land, in the same way as in India. Uh, also for status, but also as a form of investment in vehicles, in shops, in musical instruments. There are many small bands that play in, in the region and also come to the United States, earn money, buy their instruments and go back and play there or stay here and, and, and play for parties. This also tells about the importance of rituals uh, in Mexican society, but uh, it is different from the Indian case. The rituals in Mexico are perhaps not as critical for every day, at least up to what we have seen now. We have to, we, we are still in the middle of the project, of course, and we are discussing many things, and, 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 and as soon as we get into them, we can see more and more coming, and, and, and we still have to discuss a lot more. But it seems like the rituals do play um, a slightly different role in Mexico and in India. At least marriage is not as important in Mexico as it is in India. In Mexico, you would have baptisms, which would be very, very important the 15th uh, 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 birthday parties and, and, and some events. But the music is, also, uh, is always there, so this is why investment in musical instruments is important. Uh, also remittances from the United States. This is a region that has uh, uh, a lot, uh, has had traditionally a lot of people in the United States and sending remittances. Uh, increasingly, this is less so. There are many returnees Many people have come back to, to, to the state uh, because they are deported or because, or for different, or because they did not no longer found work. There were many people in the construction industry and with the crisis, of course, they did not, no longer found jobs in the United States. But lots of people were in agriculture and in the services like uh, Mexican restaurants in California. Um, also, the, but, but this region, we chose this region because of its history in cooperatives and credit associations. There is a 30-year uh, 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 experience in these cooperatives. They have been very important in shaping the, the region. They have been very important when people still received money from the government bank. They don't, they, no, uh, it's, increasingly more difficult to do so, but when they receive money for agriculture with the state bank, people would still resort to the savings cooperative instead of, of the state. So the savings cooperatives have a very important history and there are uh, many, and there's different uh, associations. There are also um, uh, plenty of roscas. People depend on roscas for, uh, to a large degree, and there are also, a few, now, it, now with the incursion of people from other parts of the states, the uh, other parts of the country, um, there is also uh, more uh, microfinancial institutions coming in. So something similar to the self-help groups in India. But still, that is not the most important. The most important is still the savings cooperatives in this region. Um, and now, in terms of the generation of value, this is uh, the picture shows uh, the production of chile, which is uh, largely for export. It's part of horticulture. And uh, also, the, the, one of the characteristics of this is that children are employed. With chile and with sugarcane, you could see that, that they use big machetes to cut the sugarcane. Well, they have children doing that work as well. And it is the parents that do it because they want to earn more money. They take their children to the work. And it's illegal, but they still do it. And it's very difficult for the employers to stop. And they don't care as well. They don't care whether it's children or not, but um, even if it's illegal. But anyway, um, now the generation of value, of course, as, as we've seen, okay, it's in the production, and most of it is agricultural production. But we have 
uh, different different uh, uh, forms of production as well. A lot of of, of cattle raising, goats, it's a little bit of goats, etc. Uh, migration is very important, as all, I have already mentioned. I'm going to go a little bit more quickly because the time is going. But um, the financial practices also have to do with the generation of value. Often, often value is generated in the practice itself, in the transaction itself. People uh, attribute value to something that perhaps did not have that kind of value. And here I am speaking of value not only in monetary terms, but in social and, and other currencies. This is why I'm saying different kinds of resources and currencies. So people are, tra in the transactions, people are uh, uh, also involving the social relations and the cultural symbols and, and the status in the transactions themselves. And so this is part of the generation of value. Also monetarization and financialization, I think we've all heard about it. We perhaps, I won't dwell in it a lot, but, but increasingly in this region, money is becoming a measure of value. And, and, and with financialization, people are investing in finance instead of investing in production and in, uh, in, in, in agricultural production or other more traditional ways of generating money. Uh, the storage of value. <clears throat> Gold as saving and social capital, as we are saying, uh, gold in Mexico is not so common, is not so commonly transacted as it is in India. Uh, in Mexico, gold is often used to pawn, to, to pawn, take to the pawn shops, etc. But in India, it is a, a very, very much a source of value, a source of status and women will wear the gold in a way that they don't wear it in Mexico. In Mexico, they might try to hide it for, to, for fear of its being stolen. Maybe we are not as honest as the Indian people, but anyway, um, uh, it seems like, like there is a lot more fear of it being stolen in Mexico than in India. Uh, uh, a cattle, as I said before, is different as well because cattle is more an investment in Mexico, whereas it is more uh, of symbolic value in India. Uh, uh, Roscas and chit funds are, uh, Roscas, chit funds is, is the same as what they are using in, 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 in India in, in the way of a Rosca. And um, that is partly a way of people storing value for the uh, short and medium term. It, I have to say that most people invest in the short and medium term. If they're going to invest in the longer term, they will buy land or they will buy a house or they will have a livestock. But mostly uh, they have money for the short and medium term. Lending, I can lend money to someone as a way of storing the money. If that, that makes it secure and I might even receive a little bit of interest in exchange. The credit and savings associations that are very common in, in Mexico more than in India, I think, um, uh, 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 people will save. In India, some people save in banks. That has to do with the financial inclusion policies in India, but they don't use, it's a small percentage. Uh, perhaps it is similar in India and Mexico, but they use it less in Mexico as a way of saving, or at least in this region of Mexico. Um, uh, value mobilization and debt. It is very important for us to see the way value is mobilized. That is partly one of the main aims of the project is to see the mobilization because it's not how much you have, but it's how you can use what you have. It's how you use these resources as a way of status, as a way of getting to where you want to get. So, um, and, and there is, there is um, uh, uh, debt has a lot to do. Looking into debt shows the, the bare bones of, of the structures uh, in, in the, the mobilization of, of, of valuables. Uh, so there is protection, debt, there is protection. We call it protection because of the Indian case where, where when you owe, you, you are protected in terms of labor. You then have labor. We wouldn't call it protection so much in Mexico, but it also happens that, that you owe somebody money and then you are expected to work in return. And also there is um, exploitation, of course, in this process uh, where, where you owe money and you have to work for it. And also there is a lot of solidarity involved in different kinds of, of mobilization. Uh, debt as a marker of hierarchies, as Isabel was saying, 
in India, you cannot borrow from somebody below the category, your cost, for example. In Mexico, you can do so, although it is less common, but it is a sign of, of, of privilege, it is, it is a prestige to lend to your patron or to your boss, that is loyalty, and so you can do it. It's, it's not so common because you don't have the money to do it, but, but you can do it. The processes of valuation are also different. I have to go very, very quickly now. And the social arrangements that take place are uh, also different in, in, in one country and the other. And then I have to just say that debt is signified, how debt is signified in terms of how the estimates are made, the predictions and the appraisals are made is something that is really important and I don't have time to go more into it. But I also have to say that we are in the middle of it so we still have a lot to do in terms of comparing the two countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. the presenters fear looking at me because time just goes very fast. These are interesting projects. Uh, but in, in the interest of fairness, we uh, have to keep to the 20 minute limit and we're doing very well. Our final presentation is uh, on this panel is by Heather Horst, RMIT University, and Aaron Taylor, University of Lisbon, Portugal, on Mobiles, Migrants, and Money, a study of mobility at the Haitian-Dominican Republic border. Okay, um, they're actually going to put up our PowerPoint and we also have a video, but I just wanted to start um, by really thanking Bill and Jenny and the sort of expanding IM IMTFI team. Um, this project was actually originally only meant to be a one-year project and uh, magically it transformed into a three-year project and has different phases and iterations. So um, really quite, um, we're sort of at the culmination of this, this work now. Um, um, but it's really been a pleasure to work with Bill and Jenny over the years. <laughs> so, um, okay, I think you can play. Um, so before, we wanted to start out our presentation today by, no audio, um, by uh, actually showing you some sort of video footage from the place where we are working, which is the southernmost border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, one of uh, what you're seeing basically here to give you some context is the view from the Dominican side. Um, the gate on the other side of the gate is the Haitian side. And this is really um, a, uh, it's sort of a Friday morning market about, uh, it was about 7.45, 8 o'clock in the morning. And people are sort of lining up waiting to come into, uh, to the, into the Dominican Republic to go into the market to sell um, goods. So I'll just let this play for a few minutes um, as I start the talk, but we just wanted to give you uh, kind of a flavor of the place uh, where we've been working. So, and then the other reason that we really wanted to uh, show this video is because it's a really poignant reminder of what Dorian Massey uh, many years ago uh, described um, in terms of places, she argues that places are not so much bounded areas as open and porous networks of social relations. So throughout this project, we view the border as a porous space that is created through state formation, materialized through laws, regulations, and social relations, and it's constituted in and through everyday practice. Um, more recently, we've been really building on some of the work by Nicholas Long, um, who's an anthropologist who uh, studies on the sort of Indonesian-Malaysian border, who's, recent, who's described the relationships that people um, and other entities have with borders um, as a process of bordering. So the shift um, to thinking about bordering acknowledges, in Long's words, the quote, effective charge and powerful symbolic weight that our informants' claims about bordering have and the kinds of border work that they engage in. So throughout this project, we've had three quite broad questions. Um, the first is really around to what extent um, are different populations living in this border region um, engaged in practices of bordering? And what does this actually look like in practice? And for example, so as Erin will talk about in, uh, when she comes up at the end, um, Haitians move actually quite regularly across the border. Um, uh, and move you know, back and forth between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but Dominicans actually very rarely cross the border, even though they have the same access um, as Haitians do to the Dominican Republic. 
Our second question was really around how and in what ways different infrastructures are shaping the processes and relationships to the border. And finally, our third question was really around the question, uh, was really around the roles of bodies, objects, and commodities and understanding people's relationships with the border and the processes of what we're calling embordering and disembordering. Uh, so let's. Okay. <laughs> So we're back to PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, this is a three-year ethnographic study which included um, a range of methods including a sort of traditional participant observation, interviews, surveys, and a portable kit study. Um, we really sort of employed a material culture studies perspective and we were also inspired by some of the, um, the work on infrastructures, particularly visible and invisible infrastructures. Um, uh, sort of spearheaded by people like Susan Lee Stahl, uh, Starr as well as Paul Durish and Genevieve Bell. One of the methods in particular that we found quite fruitful was, some, was this portable kit study, um, which was kind of a combination of uh, design research methods and a study um, called the portable kit study done by Mimi Ito, Daisuke Okabe, and uh, Ken Anderson who studied young urban professionals in Tokyo, LA, and London. Um, in our particular, and you can sort of see on this image some of the portable kits and people sort of, you know, some of the portable kits that people had and then the process you can start to see of people engaging with these objects um, throughout the study. So in our particular study, we focused upon the objects that, that people carry with them on a regular basis as they move in, across, and often beyond the border region. Um, many of these objects included things like house keys, IDs, but it also, we also um, talked a lot about clothing, jewelry, mobile phones, as well as things like uh, motorbikes, which were quite important. So while those were the kind of typical objects, we also um, had a few surprises emerging. Um, one of the instances of this were the number of people who kept uh, symbolic money in their wallets alongside the currency that actually had exchange value in the region, and those were namely Dominican pesos, Haitian gourds, and US dollars. What was interesting about symbolic money is that they were placed in wallets quite intentionally, but they weren't, it's not like my wallet where I just, you know, travel and leave a bunch of currencies around and it's quite accidental. People actually put them in their wallet because they're important and it reminds them um, of sort of the relationships of the, um, the relationships with the people who actually gave them to, gave the money to the person. So, in fact, often symbolic money was never actually used by the person who owned it, but just sort of sits in the wallet. So it's, that's kind of all I'll say about that now, but it was really quite interesting there. So I'd like to turn now our attention uh, to the first of the three key relationships um, that Aaron and I believe really highlight the processes of embordering and disembordering in this border region. And specifically here, I'll be talking about the family household and the mobile phone. So um, for those of you not familiar with um, Haitian society, um, Haitian families are generally recognized as large, complex social institutions that extend beyond the, uh, the nuclear family. Um, historically, there was one particular uh, structure that emerged called the Lacou, um, which was really a cluster of domestic units of people who lived together in compounds. Um, Lacous really emerged um, in Haiti um, in the era of plantation slavery and independence. Um, and it was really sort of a rural phenomenon where people came together, both kin and fictive kin, to work, share food and money, goods, um, share care work for children and elderly, and they also shared a religious uh, system. Um, with urbanization and globalization, however, there have been a number of debates about whether Lacous actually still exist in Haitian society. A number of people have argued that um, it's really, uh, things have really shifted to a focus on the nuclear family, um, and this has uh, placed undue burden on heads of household, and particularly women. Um, others, however, have been arguing that uh, the decline of the Lacou is overstated, and that in fact the Lacou remains still an adaptable persistent social structure throughout Haitian society. Um, indeed, there's some people who have done some work in Port-au-Prince in places like um, uh, Miami, New, uh, New York, etc., who've really shown that um, the Lacou still is a phenomenon um, in urban areas and globally, um, but it's really transformed into a sort of unit for making decisions about the household and an extended family. 
So given this sort of changing context, the mobile phone has been playing a quite key role in this adaptive social institution. Um, and I should mention here just a little bit of background about the mobile phone in this region. So um, you saw sort of Antipetes and Paternalis. Um, so Antipetes is in Haiti, uh, Paternalis in Dominican Republic. And there are actually two different telecommunications infrastructures in the, company, in, in the two countries. So on the Haitian side, you have a company called, the main company is really Digicel. Um, and then on the Paternalis Dominican Republic side, you have uh, Claro in Orange. And you can actually use, uh, you know, take your mobile from Claro and use it on the, the Haitian side within about a one kilometer region in practice. They claim it's longer or more, but it really was about one kilometer. Um, and what's particularly interesting about this is that uh, we found that Dominicans tend to, tend to only have about one phone that they use or that they own, and it's a Claro or Orange phone. But Haitians actually purchase phones um, both in the, for use in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, and if not, okay, perfect. If not, uh, multiple phone cards and at least SIM cards that they share and, and share mobile phones with other family members. So as one of our Haitian research participants, Elaine notes, keeping a mobile phone can be a quite costly. Um, there's actually very little access to electricity in uh, Antipete, so it's quite difficult to keep phones charged. Um, they also, there's a need to keep funds on, and, uh, uh, on two phones to keep it active um, so that people can use it um, in an emergency. And really the dominant reason why people had owned a mobile phone was, was to stay in touch with family and, and friends. And there's a very strong, compared to other contexts where I've worked, like Jamaica, there's most of the calls are to family. Most of the, it's a very small sort of uh, calling list, et cetera. Um, last two out of three calls are, tended to be from family members or quite close friends. Um, so it's uh, quite important here. Um, there's also a need to actually coordinate and plan your phone calls with the schedule of the border opening and closing. So the border's typically open from eight in the morning until five at night, and you can't really get stuck on the other side. So if you live in the Dominican Republic, but you go over to Haiti to use your phone, if you don't you know, cross back into the Dominican Republic, you're stuck there overnight. So um, there's a lot of sort of logistic um, uh, details to sort of keep in mind. So effectively, the choice of um, doing things like charging a phone, uh, keeping phone credit, adding minutes, and even lending a phone to a family member is often an indication of the importance of the object in enlivening these social relationships. So throughout our study, we found that the mobile phone is a central object in the maintenance of the Laku among Haitians living in this region. It represents a process of dis disembordering through its work in disrupting the separation of the family and household created by the sort of border movement and mobility. The mobile phone effectively enables social support, forms of exchange and cooperation, and facilitates a sense of care and belonging. And for many, the mobile phone could be seen as the modern day Laku, perhaps the one place where families do come together and relationships can be enlivened. So with that, I will turn the podium over to Erin. Thank you, Heather, and hi, everybody. So I'm going to build upon what Heather's been talking about with um, the mobile phone being a kind of temporary lacou facilitating uh, household relationships, family relationships, uh, by talking about how work and, re and state relationships are also constituted through objects. And certain possessions more so than others uh, tend to facilitate the mediation of these relationships, uh, especially across the border and within those relationships. So looking at the relationships not just as um, citizen to citizen, but citizen to state and employers to employees and so on and so forth. And what I want to say is that while this is arguably true of anywhere in the world that these processes occur, uh, on the border they have certain kinds of effects because of the way in which those objects are used to facilitate those border crossings and also the construction of those relationships across different kinds of borders. So uh, the first thing to note though is when we talk about the state, here we of, of course have to talk about two states. We have the Haitian state and we have the Dominican state and they both have their effects on how people need to negotiate them to, to, to arrange those relationships across borders. First, uh, one, one important thing to note is with the Haitian state, in, in the town of Vansa Pete, uh, the state actually in many ways is, is quite, 
quite absent. It's a, it's a very remote place and people are, aren't that institutionalised. So one of the main points of encounter is often actually on the border itself, although the, the Haitian authorities don't tend to have as much effect on the ability of Haitians to cross as, of course, the Dominican state does. And uh, while the town of Pedernales on the Dominican side very much depends upon Haitians crossing for labour and commerce, there is a problem in a sense, which is a, a very long-standing problem of relations between the two sides. So going back many, many years, there's been not only a, a history of labour migration, but also a very long hist history of contention between the two states. And you'll get many problems on the border, and sometimes the border um, also um, gets closed down, which actually happened in 2010 after the Haitian earthquake when there was a cholera scare. So there were a couple of weeks where the Dominican state wasn't letting anybody cross. And the Haitians were sort of saying, well, I said to, I said to a friend of ours, well, what did you do during that time? How did you work? And he said, we just did nothing. We sat around. What are we going to do? We, we, can't, we can't feasibly cross the border. So even though there are ways across, you can literally sort of walk around the fence and cross. If it's being policed, then it can be a risky situation or an expensive situation if you need to pay bribes. Uh, and so, but what I want to say though very much so is even though this border can be um, a very f fixed line, uh, it, most of the time it's actually porous as Heather was saying. And what you end up getting is a situation where the border isn't just the legal border, that's actually often the, the easiest line to cross. The other lines come when you start to move out away from the border zone and towards Santo Domingo, further into the Dominican Republic. Because what happens is that, say you get on a bus to go to Santo Domingo, your bus uh, will always be stopped by the military at numerous checkpoints along the way. Sometimes up to 14 checkpoints between Pedernales and Santo Domingo. And so every time your, uh, your bus gets stopped, um, you have to go through a certain process, uh, which, which I'll explain in, in a second. Um, so that's the, that's the movement of the border around. So because we have this porosity of the border and sort of it seems to be staged, we started thinking about the border as more like a living fence. And this is a term that we borrowed from the anthropologist Sidney Mintz, who worked in Haiti back in the 50s and 60s. And in 1962, he published an article where he described this living fence. And what it actually is, is a fence that's made of sticks that you, you cut off and you plant in the ground around uh, where you want to demarcate around your house, and the sticks grow into bushes, and so you literally have this living fence. But it is a nice metaphor for the ways in which relationships are constructed across the border, uh, because it's all these different kind of parts that, that sort of make this whole. And it is alive in the sense that it's constituted by the people and the objects they use to create that, that, um, that social network, if you like, across the border. So what happens when you encounter the state, which is part of that living fence? Well, we kind of notice that there are three main material forms that come into play. Uh, there are more than that, of course, but the, the three primary ones. And the, the very basic one, uh, you might think it's documentation such as passport and visas, but while that is there, uh, money actually trumps it. Money is the most important thing you can have with which to encounter the state. So why is this? Well, without documentation, you can still travel from Haiti to San Domingo. It's just that on your way, you need to pay a, have the money to pay a series of bribes in order to, to, to um, make the passage happen. So you need to pay the military checkpoints along the way, the, the requisite bribe, and it can cost up to 5,000 pesos, which is around, um, I, believe, I think about $200 more or less, to get to San Domingo, so it can be quite hefty. What is interesting, though, is that even for Dominicans, money can also be a basic factor in encountering the state while travelling or in other situations. So we knew a young man who was Dominican and he travelled from Pedernales to uh, a town near San Domingo and he forgot his ID card. So he still had to pay bribes, but of a lesser amount, to the military guards along the way. So money just keeps recurring in, for both nationalities, but at different kind of levels and with different sums attached to them and different levels of risk. So the second thing, of course, is documentation. And if you have your passport, your Haitian passport, and you have your Dominican visa in it, then your travel is greatly facilitated. It's far less chance of you meeting with a military officer who decides that you should go home again. And the bribes still exist, but they tend to be uh, far cheaper. What actually happens here is that if you have your visa, you should not, by rights, be paying any bribes to anybody. 
But uh, nevertheless, when you uh, get pulled over by a military checkpoint, all the Haitians get taken out of the bus and, and taken aside to pay these bribes. And there are people who do no longer, no longer pay these because they know the system and they can work around it. But there are people who um, continue to uh, pay the bribes, maybe because they're not familiar with the process, this is their first time travelling, or they um, don't quite have the confidence to stand up for themselves and say, hey, I know my rights, I, I know this is wrong. So um, there are also people who will simply just avoid this system altogether. We have another friend who, even with or without a visa, he will never take the bus. He'll take a private car in order to, um, to uh, get around the system. And another one is the body. So people can use their bodies in a way that um, helps them evade that. So they will dress respectably so that they actually don't get pulled over. So um, the next area I want to discuss briefly is work and livelihood and how objects are used to negotiate that. Uh, two forms of employment we could say are important here. One is being employed by a, a Dominican, I'm still talking about um, Haitian employment, and another one is being self-employed and these have their own objects attached to them as well. So one domestic servant uh, that we talk to who is paid about $100 a month uh, she has a kind of a patron-client relationship in which her boss will not pay her much money but she will give her things constantly and this woman's been incorporated into the household kind of like a daughter in many ways. So her boss gave her a mobile phone and this was a very interesting case because while there were a number of people we talked to who gained their mobile phones through their employment, this person retained her phone for use pretty much only with her employer. So she would use it to stay in touch to know when she had to go to work and so on. And she didn't really use that phone to facilitate further social relationships. So she didn't have many numbers in there. She didn't really call anybody. She didn't really receive calls. And this was actually um, a very unusual case. And, and um, she was also criticised by her neighbours for working for a Dominican and they would say, her, oh, you just do that because you don't know how to market, you don't know how to sell things in the border market, so that's all you can do, you have to be subservient. Uh, in the market itself, people have a great deal more, more liberty in, into how they operate and incorporate a huge amount of objects um, into, um, into um, uh, their, um, their repertoires and their relationships with people and very much can continue those more traditional, practical kind of relationships. And here we have a money changer on the right hand side and a tomato seller on the left. Uh, and just briefly, we have a friend of ours who currently, uh, he works with the people who sell in the market, so he will um, uh, ferry people around, ferry clients and goods from home to market and he also pays his cousin's uh, sky bill. So his cousin lives 80 kilometres away deep in Haiti but has a Dominican cable television account and will send the money back via mobile money uh, which uh, our friend will pick up from the local microcredit institution and pay that. So just to very briefly conclude, uh, what we're seeing here is a kind of a cross-border arbitrage where people will use uh, things from um, one side of the other to, to make this livelihood happen. And um, I want to briefly address the idea of power and privilege. So what we think we're seeing is that uh, unlike other previous studies that have been done in Dominican and Haitian relations, it's very hard to reduce what's happening to either class privilege or race uh, or just a general political economy. Rather, all these things happen in a broader material and cultural context, which is really uh, about the relationships that happen in that border space. So the fundamental aspect that produces this relationship, uh, this environment of relationships is in fact the border itself. But not just the border as that line, but rather as that living fence that is constituted by people and objects simultaneously. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Very good. I think without further ado, we should let you uh, raise some questions. Um, if you called up your hand, I'll try to note uh, where you are and I'll see when, who, who, goes, who goes first and I'll if uh, we should probably stick to relatively short questions to individuals and then once our time comes more toward 10.30, if there's still questions, we'll group them and then the presenters can respond uh, in that way. Yes, go ahead. Maybe t say your name too and speak as loud as possible. Oh. Uh, that's the best question to the second question. 
Please, would you wait for the microphone? OK, go ahead now. I'm Mani Nandi from University of Delhi. My question is addressed to Magdalena and our co-researcher. It's an interesting study between Mexico and India. But there are one or two points of clarity I'd seek from you. One is the area of study in Tamil Nadu, which is a very, it's a full big state. What is the district in Tamil Nadu which has been uh, focused upon? Uh, the second issue is when you talk about um, investments in rituals um, or expenses in rituals. Uh, uh, there, there needs to be a clarity between the two because when you're talking about investments, uh, investments in, or asset ownership is a social symbol. But when you talk about expenses and rituals in India, uh, life cycle needs like marriage, uh, births, and festivals are the expenses for which you save for the future. Thank you. The district, yes, Vulupuram and Kudalo district in northwest of Tamil Nadu. Yeah. And regarding, I, I was, uh, I think this would deserve a long comment, the uh, distinction between expense and investment. Um, I was talking about marriages and festivals as investment in the sense that people are really expecting some return from it. Uh, yeah. You had a question here in the front row? Um, okay, we were. We just have a question for Magdalena, your team, um, about migration in Mexico. Can you tell us a little bit more about what caused, I mean, what are the underlying causes of migration and how you guys uh, have kind of focused on that? Kind, I mean, the angle that you have uh, used to approach that that part of it, just, okay, thanks. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, uh, we would we, I would have to talk about two different kinds of migration. First is the migration to the United States, which was perhaps one of the long, longest tradition. Uh, in, in this region, as in many regions in Mexico, agriculture was no longer providing enough sustenance. And people started migrating when they had big events like a funeral, like a sickness in the family, when they needed uh, a, a l a large lumps of money. But they also migrated because the cousin migrated, because the family, because there was this tradition of saying those that went to the United States come back rich and I want to be rich, this kind of thing. But there was also a lot of internal migration from other villages to this region because it was, when it became an irrigation district, then people came to work in as day laborers. And now the migration that is most important is the one that from other states of Mexico, workers who, who come to labor in the sugar cane, in the tomato companies, and in the other. So it's more a labor migration. And the performance is very similar to that coming to the United States. They buy, they, 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 they buy a lot of, of, of televisions and radios and the electronics and things and take back home. So, so there is a big commercial industry also thriving in the region. So they do, and they send remittances and they also save. They're beginning to save and they have ways of saving that have to do with the patrons. They, in the sugar cane for example, they already discount some money as a way of saving so that they can take home in the end. Well, this is what they say. They also make business from it, but still, to take back home when when the the season ends. Um, this goes to uh, my name is Luisa Crehel, and um, my question goes to the panel. I'd like to see what uh, considerations you have made in your studies to really see the uh, change of uh, the cultures, how the cultures change their values what are the ethical implications of technology, and how the dynamics, now that they are connected, then you have all kinds of situations where security is, is a factor, and also the priorities of the expenditure of the family, such as first is the phone and then is the food. So what have you seen and what have you learned about this process of integrating technology in society in these poor communities? Thank you.
Maybe Sybil can start and you two can confer. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I th uh, yeah, I think that certainly raises a very important point. Um, I think there are trade-offs involved in the adoption of this technology. Um, and I guess the question is very general, but I can think of many things that come to mind. Um, the conflict uh, in marriages regarding this very uh, personal and private form of using money. Um, collected a lot of information on that. Um, the fact that uh, many people um, at the lowest, not to use that uh, negative word, but people with very little income often spend a lot of money on airtime and, and uh, uh, phone um, cards and so on. Um, and I think people are really beginning to push back against mobile money in, in Western Kenya. Um, they, are, they are beginning to feel very, very pressed by constant um, demands from relatives. So we talk to people who have thrown their phones away. Uh, some of you are familiar with some of the creative things that Kenyans do with their phones. They have two phones, they have four SIM cards, and it's all an effort to try to gain some kind of control over, um, you know, the, these connections and these networks. So um, uh, many people describe this as uh, more, of a, more of a curse than a blessing, someone uh, told us. So, you know, people are definitely beginning to, um, to push back against it. We finally worked out our answer. <laughs> so um, I mean, what's interesting about this case, I mean, we weren't really looking at sort of changes in values and, and culture there. But um, I think, I mean, there's, there's sort of two things. Um, one, I think we, we didn't really see the sort of rampant, you know, sort of spending and sort of uh, bling and, and, you know, sort of changing out phones and things like that that we've seen in other contexts, even between Haitians and Dominicans in this region, Dominicans were much more likely to be um, sort of changing out phones and keeping up and, and really sort of taking on additional expenses, whereas um, the Haitian migrants were really quite cautious and really put on a very minimal, they were, you know, constantly aware of, of savings plans and phones, kinds. they were, they're sort of economizing and sharing a lot of sort of mobile phone and SIM card sharing with people. People would leave, uh, there, you know, they would go drop off their phone in a place to have it charged with someone. Other people would use it. It was actually actually hard to get in touch with people at times because they had left their phone with someone <laughs> to charge it and take care of it. And there's certainly, um, it's not the sort of rampant, I mean, it, what's interesting is compared to the, like my previous work in Jamaica, where it really was, you know, sort of everyone was having, getting phones, they were using them, they were extending networks, really sort of doing it. Uh, the Haitians were actually quite conservative and it really was about family and uh, maintaining those connections. So I think we sort of uh, think that, at least among Haitians, that there's a strong case to be made for continuity rather than uh, transformation. The most common phones people buy are the cheapest variety, which costs about ten dollars. And uh, most people will, will save up the money, or they will borrow money often from friends and neighbours, or they will they'll be given it as a gift or lent a phone by employers till they get another one. But you do also get people who will make a business out of it, so they'll they'll buy a phone and they'll sell it at a profit because they'll travel from one city to another and then they'll go buy another couple of phones and they'll use one of the phones they're about to sell until they've sold it and they'll just keep their SIM card and they'll go and get more. So there's also that, that aspect as well. Hi, I'm Melissa Cliver. I just have a quick question about the kits that you guys were using and I wonder if you could just talk about that for a minute about how, how effective you think it was or a little bit of detail about how you put it together and a little bit more about that. I'll start and then you can add. Um, so, I mean, basically we didn't do the portable kit study till the very end of the project. So, um, and Aaron has done sort of the bulk of the field work um, there. And so it was, you know, we, we tended to approach people who um, uh, sort of she developed relationships with over the, you know, the course of really about two years. Um, and, uh, you know, that we had you know, that, that had been interviewed um, or, you know, she was sort of interacting with. Um, I, we basically, what we did was um, we asked people to sort of, you know, we, we set it up so that they would, you know, kind of bring their bag or whatever they would normally carry with them. So we did kind of a 
sort of a reenactment, really, than a sort of catch them on the street and, and see what was in their bag. You know, so they were a bit prepared um, uh, for the thing. We, I mean, there are a couple of things that were interesting about the portable kit study. We, I, I mean, I in particular really wanted to do it in their homes and to sort of see it in the broader sort of context of things. But um, um, I think it's, one of the pictures was of this sort of wash basin, and that was actually the only flat surface that we could find to actually do the portable kit study on. So. Um, we eventually, we, we started doing it in homes, in people's homes on their floors and, you know, wherever we could find it. But we also started doing it at the place where we were staying um, just because it was, um, it was often cooler, air conditioning, you know, we, they, we, they had some privacy, um, et cetera. So there were, um, I think, a number of things there. But I think, I mean, it was just really interesting. We asked, we asked them basically to sort of pull out everything and to, to sort of discuss, to group it in the things that they tend to carry with them every day and would you know absolutely essentially carry versus things that they carry less often, and then we had them sort of rank them in order of priority, um, and sort of, and so there was this process of sorting and shifting around, and I mean just really fascinating things. We you know the symbolic money. Um, uh, one woman had a breast can like a breast cancer pamphlet that she had been uh, treated for that and was carrying around with her, um, and I think. One thing that Aaron was really pointing out is um, that people uh, really felt like the safest place to keep things was actually with them on their bodies. I think, yeah. do you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, just, just simply in, in comparison with a, a more standard style interview, I actually found them quite uh, a lot easier than I had in the past just doing normal interviews with no props. Um, because people could then talk about the objects and a lot of them were related to their family. So you just get to, 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 to find out such a wealth of information about people in context. So it was just, it's just amazing. I think I would probably just about always do these in future and use some sort of prop, if not the studies and people's homes themselves. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say I really found interesting all of the panel's presentation. As an economist, I really appreciate these detailed accounts of what's happening. And a specific question to the Mexican case, um, to Margarita, it's um, as the livelihoods of people change, what happens in the context of um, trough, um, excuse me, narcotics um, policies going on and the wars going on? I know Natalia Mendoza, for example, an anthropologist that studies this, ch the change in producing um, you know, some, any kinds of seed maize to producing marijuana that changes the everyday, the livelihoods of the people. And I'm sure the mobile use also has an impact. Yes, um, this is not one of the most uh, drug producing or commercializing regions in Mexico. But there, is, there are drugs. There are drugs, especially in the areas toward, in the mountainous areas. And people will talk about it. And, and the way the livelihoods change is that there is more money circulating. Because they buy cars, because they pay for music, because they buy beer and, and drinks, etc. that drug traffickers do. So in that way, the livelihoods change. Um, they also have changed because there is more fear. Uh, there have been some kidnappings going on, and that is not precisely the drug people, but it is the violence that surrounds it that allows for, for kidnappings. And there is, uh, has been a lot of fear in that sense in this region. And that also makes people much more cautious in terms of what they do and how they go about doing their everyday uh, things. And also, the kinds of of, of uh, show of money or wealth that they, are, that they are willing to do. I mean, people will try not to show wealth so that they are not object to kidnapping and to these kinds of things. So that is also very important in terms of, 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 of the fear that is felt. And as I say again, this is not one of the regions where violence is most uh, uh, evident. But there is some, and there, it, it has had some impact as well. Why don't we collect a few questions, and each of the presenters then has a minute or so to provide whatever remarks they would still like in response to questions or what they couldn't have, you, you know, didn't have time to say but would like to. Okay. 
So uh, there was a question right there, and then on this side, I'm sorry not to be neglecting you, but the microphone is traveling in specific ways. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Ivan Small from IMTFI. I had a question for Sybil. Um, you mentioned uh, three categories of remittance use, uh, urgent need, everyday expenses, and social payments. And I was wondering if you also see these as um, request categories, and if so, how they actually map onto actual spending. Because it seems to me that um, these are kind of at the level of household spending, and it's somewhere between the, the I and the we. Um, you know, kind of categories that you were mentioning. So in that case, how is it that people would uh, spend in an in a extreme I case, for example, pleasure consumption, or in a we case where, you know, people want to spend money for savings groups? Um, can remittances be directed to these, but through these uh, kind of household uh, request categories? Uh, hi, I'm Dipti uh, from Center for Microfinance. Um, uh, my question is also for Sybil. Um, I think your study is quite interesting, uh, especially uh, at least I was not aware of you know the sharing of airtime. Uh, this is not so common in India. Um, but uh, I was quite surprised when you said like uh, many people now taking it as liability because I think there's a whole really big scope for uh, e-transaction. Uh, so. I also want to know, when you're doing this research, uh, did you come across uh, uh, something where people is using uh, this, uh, you know, uh, airtime, uh, sharing of airtime, or, you know, uses of airtime for business transaction, or giving it as credit, uh, uh, something like that? Other questions? I have a question. Very good. Concept. I have a question for Erin and Heather. Um, uh, concerning the currencies that people use, do they use currencies indistinctly in one country and the other, or how is it? How does it happen if they're on the border? Great question. Okay, this is one of my favorites. So, you maybe you can just go ahead. If there are no more questions, you answer that, and then we'll give Sybil yeah, okay. a chance to. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there. Uh, well, basically, on the border itself in these two towns, the Dominican side uses Dominican pesos virtually exclusively, apart from the, board, the, the market, at the, which is right on the border where both will be exchanged. Within answer feet, both currencies circulate, so Haitian goods and Dominican pesos. However, what is really interesting is that Haitians throughout Haiti generally do not count in Haitian good, they count in Haitian dollar, which is a fictional currency, which uh, is at a rate of, of five to one. And the reason why it exists is because the Haitian good used to be tied to the US dollar at that rate. And so today, even if you're counting, um, say you have um, 100 good, you will say you have $20, even though it no longer exists. And that is also, so what you actually have is in answer Pete in the market, you have Haitian good, you have Dominican peso, you have Haitian dollar, and you have US dollar all used together. And the uh, Haitian customs takes U.S. dollars only. <laughs> Sybil? Yes. Um, well, thank you for that question. And um, I think you're very right. Maybe these could be more specifically thought of as request categories. And sometimes um, the money that is sent is used for something else other than what people asked for, of course. And for some people, this is of great concern, and for other people, not of great concern. And uh, my, my theory about the mothers is that uh, many people, once they've given to their mother, they will allow their mother to make all of the decisions about how it's actually used. And uh, you know, someone said to me, you know, I already gave it to my mom, and, and I don't care what she does with it, and she's going to sort it out. For others, particularly when they are giving to a brother or sister, there is that concern that they will not use it for what they've 
are supposed to use it for. And this, uh, I think the farther away people are, the more remittance, the more remittance comes to stand in for the relationship and for the presence of the missing person and the more charged it, it becomes. Um, definitely. So uh, what I found with international remittances is that um, people always ask for school fees because they feel that somehow that is acceptable, a, a kind of, um, you know, human investment request to make of someone who's in America and who's probably very westernized. But once they get the money, they will do all kinds of things with it. I mean, no one would ever ask, uh, you know, for a contribution to a circumcision ceremony, but in fact they would, they would use the money for those kinds of traditional things. And so, um, yes, you're very right that that kind of elision of the categories happens all the time. Yeah, if I understood your uh, question correctly. And uh, then with the sharing of airtime, and yes, you find that people will give each other airtime in lieu of mobile money, and, and I guess that's how mobile money actually started, was that people were, were using uh, airtime um, originally. So um, I've, I've found that that happens, but not often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ladies, would you like to answer this question you didn't have a chance to about cultural change and ethical? implications or whatever you'd like to say so you also get a turn uh, maybe just say one word about the comparison because it might seem very strange to to to, to comparison is very exciting but very difficult uh, so we can ask us nobody asked the question but I was expecting this question how what, it, what does it make sense to compare these two regions which are very different on many aspects um, so first we're talking about regions I'm not talking about India, as our Indian colleague was rightly pointing out, India is extremely diverse. Tamil Nadu is extremely diverse. So what, I'm, what I've said is valid only for the few villages I've been working with. Magdalena has been talking about a particular region in, uh, in Jalisco, El Grullo. Uh, for, for, for me, and I suspect for us, the, um, and this also make the link with the title of the session, uh, 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 we're not comparing objects, we're comparing processes. And for us, uh, looking at money and, and finance is an excellent way to, uh, to look at social dynamics. Um, and we believe that uh, money and finance are an excellent uh, entry point to look at social relationships, political relationships. And it is in that way that com the comparisons, I hope, make sense. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. On that note, I would like to thank all the panelists and the audience for uh, starting us off uh, in a really exciting fashion. So this is only the start and the rest is to follow. Thank you very much.